So this chapter, we're going to move above the level of populations to communities and uh, uh, community ecologies. So in this chapter here, um, we're going to look at the interactions within uh, uh, with several populations within the same area. And here you have a clownfish uh, swimming within the tentacles of a sea anemone. There's a uh, symbiotic relationship between the two. Uh, and so in the first section here, um, these uh, biological communities are going to be different species living together, so we need to be able to define a community and describe how community composition may change across a geographic landscape. So, uh, so looking at community, communities, these are species that occur at a particular location or locality. They are going to be characterized by species richness, which is how many different kinds of species are present. And sometimes there's another value that uh, adds a little bit more as far as the number of each kind of species, and we might call that species diversity uh, besides uh, richness. So richness is just how many species, diversity or a diversity index uh, measures how many they are along with, uh, how many different species along with how many individuals within each species are in that area. And then the Community is also characterized by primary productivity, which is how much energy is produced or captured by photosynthesizers. Uh, like if you're in a rainforest, uh, the producers there define the structure, the starting structure for there. Uh, or you could be um, a desert type of uh, community. And in there, it's your primary producers that provide that structural foundation. And they're the first line of energy capture within those uh, communities. Interactions among the members uh, within that community uh, are, are going to be what rule or govern many of the ecological and evolutionary processes that we see happening in there, and some of which we're going to be covering uh, here. So there we see a, a community there coming to a, uh, a, um, a body of water there to, uh, get, uh, to get their water. And... Uh, this is, uh, it's not just uh, the overall community here. If you look at it, it looks like a community that you can see with your eyes anyway of a bunch of vertebrates, mostly animals, but then you also see some birds flying in there. So uh, sometimes the ecologist might define the bird community or the mammal community, the small mammal community, uh, or we might look more broadly. There's microorganisms and fish probably in that water. So it depends on what you want to study and how you study it. So uh, looking now at how these communities might change over time and over space, we come across a concept called ecotone. Uh, so the ecotones are going to be um, places where the environment changes abruptly. And when it does change abruptly, these ecotones, you're going to see a corresponding change in the structure of that community, starting with the plants. And then the plants are going to dictate what kind of animals uh, you see in there. Uh, so uh, these uh, changes in that community structure uh, can uh, they will vary there uh, geographically. And so here's an example of um, a, a tree community here. Uh, and this one is uh, represents some actual trees there uh, in the mountains of southeastern Arizona. Now the lines are going to represent the abundance of species. So we see that here on the on the y-axis there, and then the numbers uh, of trees per hectare. Hectare is uh, an area of 100 uh, meters by 100 meters would be a hectare. And so um, the uh, here there's going to be a change uh, as they are observing. So they're observing per hectare, but they're looking at an area where you're going from a place where perhaps um, there is a lower area where there's more water collecting and then moving uh, further and further away where it's drier. And so they look and, and measure the plants that are in there. What you see uh, as you're moving to from more wetter area to uh, drier area uh, and some moisture gradient there, you're going to see a difference in the abundance of each type of tree. Uh, so here you see uh, where it's wetter, you're going to see this, this species indicated by the green line has a great deal of abundance uh, right about this uh, uh, area here where you have a certain level of moisture. Uh, whereas where it's drier, you see this species indicated by uh, 
uh, the gold line, and you see more abundance in that species uh, overall. Now, this may totally be uh, a result of the plant's requirements for water. Some are more tolerant to dry areas, some are not, or it might be an interaction uh, between the species uh, other species as well as something in the environment. So let's take this one, this example here, the purple line here. We see it's very abundant in the mid-range of, of uh, soil moisture. Uh, and then you see the green one here with a real nice peak here where it's wetter, and then it seems to drop in correspondence with uh, the purple, of the species indicated by the purple line. And then over here at the end, you see the same species increase in abundance a little bit further away where it's drier, but you don't see this particular species with the purple line there uh, as abundant anymore. So uh, it may be uh, the interaction between the species as well. Uh, so these species change uh, in relationship to their uh, uh, the environmental conditions uh, overall. So uh, those the, the, we would see something like an ecotone. Here's a, another example here where you're looking at uh, these uh, line transects, where the, a line transect is something we're going to do in, the, in lab 20. A line transect is when you go out and you play some random uh, measuring tape a certain distance, maybe 10 meters or 20 or 30 meters, uh, and you measure along that transect. You count how many of each type of species you see. And if these transects move across an area where things like soil and moisture and other things change. You're going to see a change in the a number of species. I used to do a lab like this with my environmental uh, biology students, and we would go out to the sand dunes at South Padre Island and uh, measure these, uh, take these measuring tapes out and go along the dunes. And on uh, the windward side of the dunes where the ocean, the wind comes in off the ocean, on this side, there's salty. The air is saltier. The, the moisture that lands on this side because of the salt spray coming off of the of the ocean, hitting over here. Then on the back side, the conditions are different. So you actually see a difference in the vegetation on either side, depending on their tolerance of those species. Well, the same thing they sort of did here in this area. I'm not sure where the area is, but this is a distance along line track transects, and they have different species they're recording. And what we see is that there is a difference from normal soil to a serpentine soil, and there's a transition in the soil type <laughs> And serpentine soil has a certain number of types of uh, metals and other compounds in it. And then you have your regular soil. So you see that as you move a distance along the transect, you're moving also from one soil to another. And then there's a transition here. And you see an area where there's an ecotone, where you go from one kind of an ecosystem that's characterized by these species here, indicated by the bar, and then eventually you transition to a different kind of uh, uh, group of species or communities. So you see this ecotone from one plant community to another plant community. Uh, and so this highlights the concept of that ecotone. Uh, in this section, we're going to look at the concept of ecological niche. And your learning objectives or outcomes are to define niche and resource partitioning, and then differentiate between fundamental and realized niche, and then explain how the presence of other species can affect species a species realized niche. So what is a niche? Niche is the total of all the ways an organism uses the resources of its environment. Uh, simply said, it, it is the ecological role. That uh, the organism plays. And of course, the organism is a member of a population or a species. Uh, and so this includes things like how they use space. Are they up in the trees? Are they on the forest floor? Um, time of day? Are they nocturnal or diurnal? What kinds of foods they eat? What kind of temperatures uh, they prefer uh, within the structure of that habitat? Uh, their appropriate, uh, any appropriate conditions for mating and their moisture requirements. How much water do they need? So uh, when it, it, we talk about ecological niche, an important idea is the competition that occurs between different types of organisms. And whenever it's different types of organisms, we're talking about different species, so that's interspecific. If it was competition within the same species, then it's intra. But this is between two different species, so it's interspecific uh, competition. So 
you have uh, an intense competition that could occur between two species when they're trying to use the same resources, same water, same food, same space within that environment. And the kind of competition that can occur can be uh, an interference competition where there are physical interactions. Uh, fighting over a resource, for example, could be uh, considered an interference competition. And then there's exploitive, uh, where there's not a direct physical uh, interaction between the two different um, organisms, um, species, uh, but instead one uh, is uh, exploiting a resource uh, perhaps at a different time or better than the other one uh, and is better at competing for that resource uh, without that physical interaction. So it's really just an idea of uh, the two organisms are competing for the same resources just by consumption and not necessarily a fighting or antagonistic interactions. So when we look at uh, the types of ecological niches, there's the fundamental niche, which is uh, what you're going to get from an organism or species uh, that uh, includes all of the capabilities built into that species. And this includes uh, their physiological uh, abilities, their ability to tolerate a different range of, um, of conditions within that environment. Uh, can they handle um, a much drier area, a much wetter area? Uh, can they handle higher temperatures and the lower temperatures uh, and all kinds of extremes? So uh, in this case, without any other limits, what would their fundamental uh, niche be? However, there are things in the environment that can restrict the kinds of niches that we can observe as the human observer looking at them and trying to assess what their niche is. And those limits that are imposed cause a restriction and, and you end up observing in most times a realized niche, which is the actual set of conditions uh, for a species um, when they have that stable population that occurs there. Uh, so uh, for example, uh, if these species interact with each other uh, and there's competition that's occurring, we might see one species uh, niche be quite different than if that other species was not there uh, at the same time. So uh, uh, without that species there, then we more likely to observe a fundamental niche. So other cases that can restrict uh, a species fundamental niche um, you know, are predators. So when predators are absent, uh, we may see that a uh, species is not fully utilizing the area. If the predators are present, maybe they're hiding and not as active in that, in that area, in that environment. The absence of pollinators. If you don't have pollinators and you're not going to get fruits, so then you might not get certain kinds of fruit consumers uh, using the space there the way they might if the pollinators were present. So it could be an absence or a present as presence of a species uh, that enhances uh, the species' ability uh, to interact in that in that environment. Uh, so it's not always uh, another species present that uh, reduces or restricts the, the niche, but uh, could enhance that niche, uh, making it uh, the niche more broad in breadth. So um, you know, the the full range may not be completely. Uh, um, uh, there for their fundamental niche. So uh, we typically would see realized niches. So here's a good case with barnacles. Barnacles are uh, a type of crustacean that are sessile as adults. They're free swimming uh, larvae. Then they uh, find a solid surface like the rocks here. Sometimes they do this on boats, even whales, uh, the, the surface of whale skin uh, on piers where the poles sticking out of the water they'll become sessile and attach there and then just filter feed with their uh, using their legs, uh, modification of their legs to just pick up food. And here we have two different kinds of barnacles. One's larger and one's smaller. And one is, uh, that name looks a little difficult. This is a genus. Uh, I'm going to try this without uh, pronouncing the C there. And I'm gonna just going to say, let's call this one uh, Thamelus, uh, a Thamelus species. And then here, Semibelanus species are just giving the genus. And we're seeing a case where both are occurring on the same rock there. And the larger barnacle, Semibelanus, we see is located right below the tide line here. So this, this low line right here is where the water level goes during low tide. Uh, and then when the moon pulls that water to this area, it brings the, the tide up and the level of the water rises. 
and that seems to be the area between those two is called the intertidal zone uh, because it's between the two tides, intertidal. And it seems that that a thamelus is good at, at the intertidal zone and it can tolerate uh, not being submerged in water, so they're adapted to that. Um, and then you have the Sembalanus, which has it appears to have to be below the line, but we can't tell because the two are occurring together. Uh, <clears throat> and so in the case where we don't see the larger barnacle, which is on the right, you see that that smaller species, the Thamelus, is actually able to spread out further down into the rocky area, uh, further underwater. And so here's a case where the larger barnacle is restricting the full utilization of space of that smaller barnacle uh, restricting its niche that we observe. So uh, in this case here on the left picture here, uh, the location where we see the small barnacles here is the realized niche. In the absence of the larger barnacle, we get the fundamental niche of this, uh, showing the full capabilities of this uh, organism to use this barnacle to use this entire uh, niche area. Now, if we were to comb over here and remove the smaller barnacles, the larger barnacles are not going to be able to move above water because their niche, fundamental niche, is different. Even in the absence of a, a potential competitor for, for space here, the larger barnacles' physiological um, uh, adaptation does not allow it to uh, be adapted to living out of water. So, um, the two do show different fundamental niches. Uh, so uh, then there's the idea of competitive exclusion. And here, uh, the basic idea is this. If your niche as a species, species one has a niche, uh, its fundamental niche, and the other species fundamental niche are exactly the same. That means they're going to be using the same kinds of resources available to them exactly the same way, and there's going to now be intense competition. And that intense competition is going to cause problems for the two species because they're going to be in such a battle for competing for it, whether it's physically indirect or just through consumption, they're going to have enough hard enough time surviving, and if they do, they're going to have a hard enough time, a hard time finding enough energy uh, to be able to produce offspring. Uh, so the idea for competitive exclusion, the principle as uh, well stated would be saying that two, that no two species can have exactly the same niche. We're talking about a, an area, uh, a, a region, a, a locality where the two species occur. So no two species can have the exact same niche. The prediction would be that uh, if that was the case, then um, either w one species is going to lose out or both would lose out and not be able to establish a, uh, a decent population in the area. So what would have to happen here? Either one is excluded from the area, that's why it's called competitive exclusion, and there's a winner, or um, the two would have to modify their niches in some way. Uh, and this modification... Uh, may happen, may have to happen over many generations. Uh, so natural selection is shaping uh, those uh, fundamental niches for these. Now, this uh, competitive exclusion is has been observed on a microscopic scale with the uh, protist called paramecium, which we studied in the, in the lecture in the laboratory already. Uh, there's different paramecium species, uh, and uh, uh, investigator named Gauss uh, studied this a classic experiment with three different paramecium species. This one is Paramecium aurelia, uh, this one is Caudatum, and then this one is uh, Bers... Uh, I forget the name. Uh, Bersaria is the name. So uh, when we write the genus first and then you write, it's the same genus, you can uh, abbreviate it. That's the convention we use. So this is Paramecium bursaria. So this in the green one. So this is Bersaria... Paramecium bursaria, this is Paramecium caudatum, and this is Paramecium aurelia. Okay. And what happens here is if you, and this is observed in a laboratory setting, so they are growing a population of Paramecium, they start off with low level, and you can see we have this characteristic early exponential growth, which we covered in the last chapter, 
Uh, and then there's a slowing down in the growth rate of that population. And then we see a shift. So you see that sigmoidal curve. We see this logistic growth. And in the absence of other competitors in that environment, this is the carrying capacity for that paramecium aurelia. We can apply the same way of thinking for caudatum. There's its carrying capacity. Uh, and we might say without any other uh, competitors, this would be the fundamental niches, the population they can establish within that uh, laboratory setting. And then here is the uh, carrying capacity for Bursaria. Now, if we put two of these together, they might experience some competition because they're, uh, they may have some similar niches. And so uh, Gauss uh, put together uh, Aurelia and Caudatum, and both of them at low numbers, and both of them showed an initial growth. Uh, and then it seems that uh, Caudatum began to, its population began to diminish and eventually disappear, uh, and it got excluded. And the winner here seems to be Aurelia. So here, this is a case where we see an exclusion, perhaps because the two have uh, perhaps a very, uh, almost the exact same fundamental niches. And so one had to be excluded because the competition was too intense. And so now we might predict that, well, we didn't do this with Bursaria. What if we mix Bursaria with one or, or the other one of these? And so uh, the prediction would be that perhaps they're going to have some intense competition as well. And so we put these two together and we did not get um uh, an exclusion of one or the other. Instead, both managed to hit some level of carrying capacity in, in each other's presence within that microcosm, within that uh, uh, aquarium or wherever they're growing these. And uh, instead, what happens is that the two ended up partitioning uh, or separating uh, their resources. So we see that their realized niche here uh, is going to be at lower numbers, but both are able to maintain and sustain a population there. Um, and the reason for this is uh, there was some overlap with the niche, but the reason the two are able to coexist is because the two managed in their vessel, maybe it's a glass of water, some kind of container, that the two were able to separate where they were living in space. So one species was stayed up higher, the other one stayed down lower, and they were able to coexist by dividing up their resources. These hanging up at the top, one species and the other one on the bottom. That wasn't the case with the other one where they were not able to manage to separate. Perhaps both hung around at the top of the water column and the, and, and, uh, the competition was too intense, so one lost uh, here. So this brings up uh, another kind of study of lizards in this um, a tropical grassland area uh, tropical uh, savanna type. And you have some lizards that basically are going to divide up their, the, the space in which they live. They refer to these as sympatric, and sim means same. And patric is derived from the word patrio, uh, which means father, uh, patriot, like when we talk about uh, uh, your home country. Uh, so uh, literally translated means from the same uh, place or same location. So these are all living in the same place. Uh, uh, allopatric would mean they don't even live in the same area. So this, so we're looking at sympatric. Uh, allos means different. Sim means same. So allopatric would be living in different areas. But here these uh, lizards behaviorally are able to avoid direct competition by living in different places. One lizard living on a different tree. Uh, this beautiful animal living on the uh, up toward the top, another one living on the tree bark, and one living on or near the ground, and that reduces competition. And these are behavioral uh, characteristics for these lizards, to where if you remove one of these lizards, these lizards are still going to have maybe perhaps have a tendency to stay up higher. However, in the absence of this potential competitor, their fundamental niche may be further down. Uh, and they're able to exploit insects along the bark further, but probably maybe not go all the way down to the ground. Okay. Uh, and so uh, in this case here, uh, species that do share this location, they're sent St. Patrick, are going to do what's called a resource partitioning. And a resource can be the food, water, shelter, uh, where you shelter yourself. The, the space where you live, all of the living spaces, all of these are resources, right? So uh, when we see this uh, species that are very similar um, overall, when they're occurring in the same geographic area, 
we're going to see this resource partitioning, which is going to reduce uh, that competition. And what ends up happening here is that over many generations, this intense competition for these resources actually shapes the way the species behaves and maybe even the way it might look structurally. Here we have a, a family of, of birds that are commonly called warblers. They are all very similar in structure, in habit. They bounce around trees, uh, tree limbs, running around looking for small insects. Uh, and so if that's the case, then there's going to be intense competition. And these birds migrate through here. Uh, most of these uh, I've seen here in this area, like the yellow rump warbler, black burnian, and um, the bay breasted. They come here in the winter here, or migrate through here, and, and uh, in winter go further south. But they all nest up in the boreal forest further up north, where you have all these uh, conifers. And when they get up there, they end up actually partitioning where they hang out and look for insects. So this species would hang out here. We have another one. Over here, the Cape May Warbler that uh, is toward the top. We have the Black Burnian, which is more right on the outside of the outer edges of the branches. The yellow rumped here toward the bottom. I see these these are winter residents here, and you see them in there. You're always on the lower parts of the trees. Uh, and so even when they're not in their, their uh, breeding grounds, they are still behaving that way because natural selection has shaped these behaviors over many generations in such a way that they have a characteristic foraging area or spot that they do that's just been programmed into them through many generations of trying to avoid intense competition. Uh, another uh, thing that can occur, and in the, when it comes to characters, these are things we define that we can observe and measure. Uh, when it comes to this sort of thing, we can actually see this with um, morphological, which are structural characters. As you can see this uh, with behaviors when uh, these warblers uh, where they might occur, uh, for example, here, uh, the, uh, when something like the yellow rump warbler is here hanging out here in South Texas, they, they're still spending time towards the bottom of those trees, even when the other warblers aren't around. It's been programmed in there, so that's their character, a behavioral character. But you can also have morphological characters that are going to show a sort of a displacement uh, when we have some uh, competition going on. And what's meant by that is that uh, natural selection starts to select for these characteristics to differ. It might be behaviors. Perhaps they, the uh, many, many generations ago, these birds were all spending time in the same areas on the tree, and then over time, they start spending uh, more time in other areas of the, in separate areas of the tree, just like with the lizards uh, as well, the lizard example. So here, you have two species of finches that uh, are occurring on uh, volcanic islands. And this is actually uh, really seen in um, in the Galapagos Island, the famous Galapagos Islands there off of the coast of Ecuador, where Charles Darwin visited. And when it, when it comes to any characteristic uh, uh, in a species, and you, and you try to measure and quantify it, whatever it is, it, it could be uh, you quantify and measure a behavior, how much time they spent on the bottom of a tree, the warblers. Here, we can quantify bill depth. Bill depth is how, how thick the bill is. Okay? And so that would be your variable x. And over here are uh, bigger bill depths, and over here are smaller. And within a population, they're all never the same. There's always variation. That's something we've been talking about since biology one class. And so when you do, you start measuring them. You go and you capture them with special equipment, uh, mist nets they use, and then you band and you mark them, and then you release them. Before you do, you measure their bill depth and other measurements. But if we were to plot bill depth and we scale the axis there and you start putting the dots, okay, that's one bill depth, one is a bit larger, one smaller, another one that's exactly like this one. So you start stacking. Some noise. This, by the way, is frequency. How many have that value? Another one there, and then uh, an extreme one. This is within the same population, the same species. And you start plotting the dots. You're going to start to get a pattern. And this pattern is seen commonly in nature or just about anything. It's even seen in the classroom. When I plot grades, let's say X was grades, you're going to get this. You end up getting the data distributed along the possible values where the more frequent values are here in the middle and the extremes are out to the side, then you get this distribution called a normal distribution. Okay? And these represent the possible values, and the majority of them are here in the middle, the average values. But you have some larger bills out here and smaller ones, so there's variation in that population. There's like there's tall and short people, right? 
Okay, like uh, so uh, that's the case there. Uh, and so when you have the, these, these are actually two different species of finch. They live on two separate islands there in the Galapagos Island. Uh, and there's a variety of seed, uh, seed types and sizes, big seeds, smaller seeds. Big seeds are harder to crack open than the smaller ones. So you have uh, this species living on one island and this one living on another one, and there's no competition. So they're taking on a variety of seeds. But there is an island where these two same species have been living for many, many generations perhaps uh, thousands of years on the same island. And the two are seed eaters. Finches like to eat seeds. And so what you see here is that this species over time has grown to have a larger bill. Now the individuals don't. Remember, there's variation in that population and there's been a range. Uh, but on this island, it seems that this species, those with larger bills are more successful at getting food because they're avoiding competition with the other species that's getting the smaller seed food uh, for them uh, for themselves. And so uh, what happens here is the competition is reduced and those with larger bills are going to be more successful at producing offspring. So over time, the larger bill ones for this species are more successful at surviving and reproducing. And over time, the, uh, the range of the bill depths tends to in, uh, increase in size. And for the other one, decrease in size. So if we take that way of thinking here, and I'm going to do this backwards so it matches the picture here. And let's call this one species one and this one species two. And we look over here at these graphs. So this represents that bell curve or that uh, distribution for the build depth. The characteristic is build depth, the character for species one on this island here. Okay. And species two, this represents the bill depth for this one on this side. There are slight differences, and you can see the ranges overlap big time. Right? So I come down here, there's overlap all right here. Okay? And so what we see here uh, is that there's a small area out here where there's no overlap, and a small area out here where there's no overlap when they're on two different islands the range and the distribution of those bill depths. Now, when they're on the same island, we see that there's a, a big difference. Species one, the average values are more towards the left, in other words, smaller. There's still a range of bill depths, but most of those are, most of the, most of the bill sizes are uh, smaller now. And then for species number two, when they're occurring together, the bill size on average is much bigger. There's still a range of them, but for overall, the two characters have been displaced. In other words, they've separated and resolved out because of that intense competition. And that's what we see here and here. Believe it or not, this is the same species. It's just the variation in this population on this island is bigger. It's just like if we go visit a professional basketball team, that population of basketball players is overall going to be bigger, right? Uh, so uh, that's called character displacement. Uh, in fact, this is actually really seen in, uh, in the Galapagos Islands with actual species. You can see that when the two species don't live together on different islands, they're called allopatric. So this one is Geospiza phylogenosa and Geospiza fortis. Uh, one is on a little, small, little island. The Galapagos is a chain of, of volcanic islands like Hawaii. Uh, and there's some little tiny little islands, islets called Los Hermanos Islets, and that's where this species occurs. And here is its range of bill depths. The, the bottom scale gives you the bill, the beak depth. And then for Fortis, here is it. And you can see that the ranges do overlap. Okay. Uh, and where they don't overlap is smaller bill depth. Uh, and uh, over here for this one, larger bill depths, right? So when you put the two together, natural selection is going to favor uh, that Fortis uh, starts eating larger seeds to avoid competition with the other species that's going to be eating smaller seeds. And over time, the average bill depths for these two has uh, displaced from each other or displaced from where they were on separate islands. So we can also see evidence of competition in experimental uh, situation and what effects this competition can have over many generations. So let's say that, uh, this actual study was done in, uh, in the late 1980s uh, with seed-eating rodents and kangaroo rats. And kangaroo rats are much larger than some of the other seed-eating ro uh, rodents that were sympatric in that area that they were studying. Uh, 
and they set up these 50 by 50 uh, millimeter, uh, not millimeter, meter enclosures. So meters is big, so 50 by 50. And they set them up and they put little openings that allow these rodents access to get into these areas. And they made the openings sm uh, too small for the kangaroo rats to get in. So only the smaller CDD and rodents can get in there. And then they had other areas, controlled areas, where they didn't restrict the kangaroo rats. So the kangaroo rats were allowed uh, to uh, be in the same exact little uh, sample area, sampling areas with those rodents. And you can see uh, what happens to the numbers of those other rodents when the kangaroo rats were allowed to be present. And these dots here on this graph are the other rodents, not the kangaroo rat. And the color coding here says that if it's blue, Blue is going to be in those 50 by 50 meter plots where the kangaroo rats were allowed to be. The control, probably. The experimental is where you restrict the kangaroo rats uh, in there. And you can see that the, uh, the rodents where the kangaroo rats were not allowed to be, the rodent numbers were much higher. Okay? And so this shows direct evidence that competition can limit numbers. And when numbers are limited, then there's potential for... Uh, these these types of changes that can occur, like character displacements. In this section on community ecology, we're going to look at the predator-prey relationships here. Uh, so your first learning outcome is to define predation and then describe the effects of predation that predation can have on a population. Uh, so what is predation? Predation is when one organism consumes another organism. The, the one that's doing the consumption is the predator, and the one that uh, gets eaten is the prey. Uh, now, predation can strongly influence the population, and that's uh, shown here in the, the diagram of two uh, ciliates, which are uh, protists. One is didinium, uh, did it, didinium, and the other one is paramecium. And didinium is a predator of paramecium. And I have some video there showing um, some of those didiniums moving around. And I think it even shows uh, paramecia in there, and I think uh, at some point during the video they show, uh, there you go, there's uh, the, the dinium eating actually taking in uh, the uh, paramecium. Um, so they, uh, I guess, are voracious predators at a microscopic level. And so here in this uh, one experiment, the uh, number of individuals they had the paramecium probably living in some carrying capacity here to start with. Uh, and then they introduced at day zero, uh, which is when they first introduced the didinium at low levels. The, uh, and so they're, now they're starting to eat paramecium, just like you see in the video there. And the population size goes up. While that's going on, they're eating the paramecium. So you see the paramecium drop and eventually the paramecium uh, com completely get lost. And then um, because there's nothing else to eat, you start to see a decrease in the number of didinium in the uh, uh, in that uh, microcosm that's being studied there. So prey populations. Here I, I chose an image of peregrine falcon. Uh, they are uh, really good at capturing pigeons on the wing. Uh, pigeons are pretty agile in the air, but the peregrine falcon is just an amazing, amazing predator. Um, so when it when it comes to prey items. Without their uh, predators, the prey, like say rabbits or whatever, uh, you, maybe a herbivores, they um, have potential to increase in size tremendously. And so predators play an important role in helping to keep prey populations in check. And it works both ways. If uh, the prey numbers go too small, then that helps keep down the uh, predator population. So this has been true with uh, the white-tailed deer population out in the east. Uh, people are, uh, uh, it, it's pretty common to end up hitting a deer on a highway. And one of the reasons the deer numbers have gotten so high is because the natural predator, the wolf, has been exterminated from much of America, unfortunately. Um, when it comes to introductions in other places, rats, dogs, cats, on islands, those uh, types of animals don't have any natural predators. Now, yes, a dog is a carnivore, but there is nothing out there that's actively uh, competing with them or eating uh, these kinds of animals. And so their population numbers can increase significantly. And if they're introduced, they don't belong there. They end up doing damage to the local ecosystem. So they become what we refer to as invasive exotic species. Uh, and uh, in fact, one invading cat 
introduced on a, on a new uh, in New Zealand on a, on an island uh, off of New Zealand actually wiped out a wren, which is a, a small little small bird. So that was very unfortunate. The cat didn't belong there, uh, and um, that's uh, what happens when we introduce species that don't belong anywhere. Now, uh, as it turns out, um, uh, predator and prey are uh, in a constant struggle to survive, and so the survivors reproduce. And so if you're really good at capturing prey, uh, you're going to have enough energy available to produce more offspring. So uh, good predators leave more offspring. If you have trouble getting food, then uh, you're probably not going to be, your chances of leaving offspring are lower. So they'll be less like you in the population. And the same thing for prey. If you're good at escaping predators, then you're more likely to survive and reproduce. So there's a sort of a co-evolution that's occurring there, a sort of an arms race between predator and prey. Uh, in fact, sometimes uh, the agility that we see in the pigeons, um, there's been some study on this, not necessarily on their shape, but when I look at a pigeon, sometimes I mistake it for a, a falcon, like this peregrine falcon. Uh, and um, perhaps some sort of co-evolution has occurred in the maneuver, the way the falcon can maneuver in the air uh, and the way the pigeon can as well. Uh, but there's some other interesting research on other ways that pigeons have evolved uh, uh, to handle the kind of predation on this uh, uh, falcon here that's actually pretty specialized for capturing these uh, rock uh, or these pigeons. Uh, so plants uh, can also, we can think of them as being prey as well. If they're being eaten by a herbivore, it's kind of like the herbivore is a predator. So it's a form of predation. Uh, many times the plant may not uh, survive, uh, may not uh, be uh, eaten completely to where the whole plant dies. So uh, the difference there, a predator actually kills the, the prey here. But damage can still be caused to the plant. And so um, plants have evolved mechanisms as well due to that uh, herbivory. Uh, and in some cases, these things are uh, physical defenses like thorns, which is not actually even mentioned here. Uh, but in other cases, these are chemical defenses. So they produce compounds uh, just by chance mutation that, that actually reduce uh, herbivores, herbivores from eating them. They include oils, uh, chemicals that are, might attract other predators, which would uh, scare off the, the herbivores from being there. Or they produce uh, milky substances that are poisonous, um, like a latexy type of material. And some of the herbivores actually co-evolved to be able to handle uh, those compounds. So like this caterpillar right here uh, is probably consuming a plant. And in some cases, some of the plants uh, are milkweeds. I'm, I'm not sure what caterpillar this is, but they produce that latex. And these caterpillars can actually eat it and be able to um, store that compound within their bodies instead of it affecting them uh, and being toxic to them. Store that compound in their body. And then uh, if a predator comes and tries to eat them, then the predator is going to be harmed by that. Uh, and so this uh, caterpillar is a larva. We have complete metamorphosis, like we covered uh, in the chapter, and there's a butterfly that comes from that caterpillar. Uh, and then we have, um, in the case, like uh, in this uh, case here, uh, those chemical defenses, the monarch butterfly is one of those that eats from the milkweed. Uh, and uh, that's what's talking about here. The, the milkweed is the host plant for the caterpillar larva. The caterpillar eats the plants and then uh, goes through the pupil stage and then uh, turns to an adult. And the adult is still carrying some of those uh, toxic compounds uh, called glycosides. And when a predator eats it, it's going to be very distasteful. Now, the butterfly is probably dead for the experience here. Uh, but this blue jay has picked it up, tried to eat it, and then uh, immediately throws it up because of the compounds in there. Uh, a gag response and they spit it back out. Now, if this blue jay is smart enough, it's going to remember the way this butterfly looked and other members in the population are protected because of the experience this blue jay had by uh, eating, trying to eat that butterfly there. Uh, so that's an interesting uh, uh, connection there. And then we have um, bright coloration uh, on uh, some uh, potential prey items that uh, in which the coloration actually... Uh, tells a potential predator that uh, there might be something dangerous about me, like these poison dart frogs. Uh, 
They belong to a family called the Dendrobatidae, and they produce secretions on their skin that are very toxic, these toxic alkaloids. Uh, and uh, they have this accompanying bright uh, colored skin. And so that's called warning coloration. It's also called aposematic. Apo means to go away. Uh, so uh, that's the, or, or the, the, the meaning for that term, aposematic coloration. So you can see that aposematic coloration as a, as a, a sort of a defensive coloration in this coral snake here, uh, which we do have here in South Texas. Uh, other defensive colorations include camouflage. So instead of the aposematic coloration like we see in the coral, uh, we have cryptic, which is a fancy way of saying uh, camouflage. So here we see this cryptic coloration uh, in this caterpillar that looks like the branch that it's standing on. So here's the branch. It's You can see it eating the leaves there. And uh, if you just look quickly and didn't watch it very carefully, you, you wouldn't even notice that it was there. Uh, and uh, many other kinds of animals, even vertebrates, uh, do have some camouflage uh, uh, in their fur and so on. Uh, and then uh, we have mimicry. Just like the coral snake had that bright banded color, this is a milk snake. Um, totally different uh, 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 genus of snake and so and a different family that doesn't produce a poison. So they're not, I should say venom, they're, they're non-venomous, but they look dangerous if the predator doesn't, uh, can't really tell and they know oh, that's bright and they learn over many uh, generations of evolution, stay away from bright color. Uh, so here's a case where one snake species mimics uh, just by chance coloration. This coloration evolves within the snake because it's afforded a sort of protection from its poisonous uh, counterpart there uh, with the um, a coral snake. So this is a milk snake. Now they're, they're referencing mimicry here uh, in the context of uh, insects that produce distasteful uh, chemicals, uh, compounds like when the blue jay threw up. But this is also could be considered a form of mimicry. It's not that the snake is producing distasteful compounds like the butterfly. So in they're doing the mimicry in the context of butterflies and, and they produce uh, those toxic compounds that uh, is toxic, usually doesn't taste good. Um, and so there's going to be two types of mimicry. So here's, this is the kind of mimicry seen in two different uh, vertebrate reptiles uh, or snakes. But when it comes to mimicry with those insects like the butterflies, there's two kinds. There's Batesian mimicry and Mullerian mimicry. And in the Batesian mimicry, uh, I think I have the same uh, information here. Yeah, so we're, we have the same information here. And here's the, the pictures of the butterflies. In the Batesian mimicry, the mimics look like the distasteful species. Uh, so... Uh, and um, this is the case here in the Batesian mimicry, where one of the species, and they look somewhat similar. They have a dark uh, forewing, and their hind wing uh, has a bluish color to it, similar shape. Uh, one of these is a distasteful, toxic uh, butterfly, and the other one is not. And so the other one, uh, they uh, gets its protection from uh, looking alike, uh, one that doesn't taste good and one that has toxic compounds in it. And then there's Mullerian mimicry where both species are actually toxic and they just, uh, they evolve on their own and they end up looking similar to each other. Uh, and these happen to be in the same genus, so they're probably closely related, but the two species here, um, four species here look, uh, two of them look alike and then the other two look alike. And that would be called Mullerian, where uh, they resemble each other and they're poisonous. So that's the difference. Batesian, one is not poisonous, the other one is. And then the and, you know, Mullerian, both are poisonous and they look similar to each other. Uh, so in one sense, they're sort of, through their look, they're warning every uh, potential predators, we don't taste good. So in this uh, section, we're going to look at species interactions or relationships among species. And your learning outcomes here are to explain the different forms of symbiosis, which means to live together, and to describe how coevolution occurs between mutual, mutualistic partners, and then explain how the occurrence of one ecological process may affect the outcome of another occurring at the same time. So we're going to look first at symbiosis, and here's where two or more kinds of organisms interact in a more or less uh, permanent relationships. Uh, and because of this interaction, there's potential for co-evolution, just as there was with predator and prey we saw in the last section. 
each species goes through an evolution that influences the other, so they evolve together. Uh, and there's some really extreme uh, cases of this where if you look at a, a bee, uh, not a bee, but an insect pollinates a flower, sometimes the flower evolves so specifically with an insect, there's only one kind of insect that can pollinate the flower, which kind of puts them at a dead end because if the insect population crashes, then the flower is going to have a problem getting its flowers pollinated. But there's three kinds of symbiosis. Symbioses would be plural. Uh, here there's commensalism, mutualism, and parasitism that we're going to consider here. Okay, there's other relationships, but we're just going to consider these three common generalizations. For mutualism, it's mutual. Both benefit. Uh, both species benefit from the relationship. Uh, they co-evolve. An uh, example would be, of uh, co uh, this coevolution would be uh, flowering plants and insects, as I mentioned earlier. There's another interesting case with uh, ants and acacias. These are uh, 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 trees that are in the genus Acacia, would be the um, um, uh, genus name. And there's many species within that uh, acacia. We have one here we commonly call the Wisacha. It's, I think, Acacia smallii is the scientific name. But here, the this acacia that uh, has evolved with certain ants, Not I'm not saying that this is true of the Wisacha we have around here, but uh, they evolve with, the, the plant evolves with a place for these ants to live uh, in these hollow thorns. And then the ants sort of provide this protection against herbivory. So if, uh, if uh, a herbivore comes by and tries to browse and eat the leaves off of the tree, the ants immediately respond by stinging painfully the animal, and that protects the, uh, the tree from further herbivory or uh, predation by the herbivore. Uh, and then, so here's a picture of the, of the acacia ant, and, and the genus is Pseudomyromex. Um, so these are the ones that do this, and this is in, uh, in, in Latin America. Uh, so that would be in, uh, in uh, tropical America here. Uh, and then uh, there are other ants that may live with these types of trees or acacias, and the relationship is not necessarily mutualistic. If we go across the ocean to Kenya, there are species of ants that do live on acacias, and one uh, doesn't seem to provide a benefit, but rather harms the acacia plant. Uh, and so um, the species actually clips the acacia branches, uh, cuts around there, and then the branches fall off. And that prevents other ants from living on the tree, so it prevents a competition between the two ants. But clipping the branches basically sterilizes the tree because it's cutting off the branches where flowers, the buds of flowers would normally grow. Uh, and so this is a harmful relationship and might be considered a parasitic rather than a mutualistic relationship. Speaking of parasitism, in parasitism, the parasite benefits and uh, this comes at the expense of the other. You're probably familiar with uh, external parasites or ec ectoparasites, uh, especially now that we're getting into the warmer months. Um, times we have lots of rain and, and the hot weather. Uh, fleas and ticks become more common. So here I've just uh, found a life cycle of a flea, uh, you're a common dog flea, and the eggs to larva, uh, and then uh, back on the dog again. Uh, and those would be called ectoparasites, ticks uh, as well, living on the outside of the body. And then there's endoparasites, and we've seen some of those in our laboratory studies and studies of protists and worms. They live within the body. There's a rather interesting one that you're going to see playing the video here, uh, it's an endo, a type of endoparasite relationship called a parasitoid. And for parasitoids, the, uh, the host uh, is going to have the parasite with, uh, within its body. And the parasite larva eats, the, literally eats from the, the host alive from inside. It'll avoid vital organs and just be in there stealing nutrients and other stuff. But when it bursts out of the body of the host, the host pays for it with its life. So it's a, um, a um, perhaps more of a somewhere between a parasite and a uh, predator type of relationship because the host ends up paying for it with its life. So let's watch this uh, parasitic wasp emerge from this fly. That's a fly. It's uh, fly is fixing to die at this point.
uh, once the adult emerges. So this was a larval wasp, and it comes out as an adult. And you can tell because it's going to have its wings and fly off. Uh, and well, they didn't show it fly, but it's uh, once the insect gets its wings, it's an adult. So I think this type of relationship, it's called parasitoid was maybe the inspiration for the movie series, uh, the one's titled Aliens, which started uh, back in 1979, I think, with a movie just titled Alien, singular. Uh, and it was uh, the, the movie that started uh, all those different alien, alien movies. Uh, and so wasps are, uh, wasps and actually flies actually are, have these type of parasitoid uh, uh, relationships. There's wasps that parasit specialize in parasitizing spiders, for example, they're called spider hawk. Uh, wasps. So that's interesting. Uh, and there are actually parasitic plants and uh, there's different shades of parasitism among plants. So uh, some plants are parasitic on other plants. And this one here, that yellow colored plant you can see uh, on the ground cover there is parasitizing other plants and grows its roots into the tissues of the host plant. Uh, this daughter can't even make its own uh, food by photosynthesis. Other kinds of parasites will steal minerals uh, from the other plant by growing in it, like mistletoe. But the mistletoe actually still has its chloroplasts and can still do photosynthesis. So there are different, different levels of parasitism. Not all plants, but there are there is such a thing as parasitic plants, which is pretty uh, bizarre when you first uh, hear of it. And then uh, uh, there's some of the internal parasites uh, that we had seen already through laboratory and lecture covering animals. We went over flatworms. Those are animals that are parasites. Uh, in most cases, there's free-living flatworms, the turbularians. But remember, the cestodes and the trematodes were uh, internal parasites uh, and very specialized for being uh, in that way. And we're going to call these endoparasites because they live in the host. And uh, many of them are going to have uh, extreme specialization because of the location where they live. Uh, the structure may be simple uh, overall. Uh, remember that tapeworms don't even have a digestive system like uh, the life cycle we see over here of the beef and, and pork tapeworm. They're two different species, uh, but they have similar life cycle pattern. Uh, they're, they become quite simple and just egg-making machines. They live in an environment where there's nutrients dissolved, so they don't need their own digestive uh, uh, system or gastrovascular cavity. Uh, so, and, and this life cycle is somewhat complex for the tapeworm. You see here the definitive host is where the adult is, so that's a term you need to remember uh, for your laboratory exam and for lecture. Uh, the intermediate hosts are the ones where there's some larval stage here. So here you can see that there is a beef tapeworm called Tyenia as the genus, which is a representative you need to know for tapeworms. And there's saginata and solanum. Saginata is the beef and uh, solanum is the pork worm. And humans eat both. So if these uh, host, uh, intermediate hosts, the pig and the, and the cow, have picked up uh, the tapeworm by eating the eggs that were released, uh, then uh, the larval stage goes and ends up insisting in the flesh of these uh, animals. And then if you eat it undercooked, uh, uh, meat that has been uh, infected with the cysts of these tapeworms, of larval tapeworms, you can eat them, ingest it, and then gets into and attaches to the wall of your small intestine there. And then those proglottids break off and put eggs back in the environment. And then there's this fancy one here, this uh, Dicrocilium dendro dendriticum, uh, which is a flatworm that's a trematode, so it's in the class trematoda. The tapeworms are in the cestoda. So this is a trematode for the class trematoda, and the trematodes are known for having complex life cycles. Again, uh, in this case, the actual normal natural host are ungulates, or uh, those are uh, the uh, ruminant animals like cows and deers. Then uh, the ungulate, they're the ones that walk on their toes, paired to a pair of hooves, and deer and cows are the ones that have the the, um, the multiple stomach type. And they eat vegetation. The interesting thing about this is that the larva, the cercari, they get into the intermediate host of an ant. Because the ant picks up uh, the cercari from the environment uh, that were released by the snail. So here's another snail host. This is a, a fluke, like the liver flukes we studied. It's just in a different genus. But the larva, the cercari, causes the behavior of the ant to change. And the ant climbs up a leaf blade. Uh, and then just locks on with its mandibles, with its mouth parts, locks on there, and then uh, a cow or a deer or something goes by and uh, uh, eats the the animal and then gets infected with it. Uh, 
norm the normal host. Now the, the human gets it. This uh, the larva finds its way to the bile duct, which is uh, connecting the liver to the gallbladder. And the gallbladder produces uh, uh, bile, which helps digest fats, uh, associated with digestion. But this uh, the adult uh, um, fluke. Uh, will reside there and then produce eggs that would be released into the environment to repeat the life cycle. So a key point here again, complex life cycle for this for these particular flatworm parasites. And then there's commensalism and commensalism here uh, one species benefits but no harm or any good is apparent that uh, we are able to tell here. Uh, and a good example here is a, uh, um, uh, a, species, a, a type of plant called a Spanish moss. It's not a true moss because we studied mosses. Remember, they belong to the phylum Bryophyta. Uh, the Spanish moss is actually a flowering plant. So they're in the phylum Anthophyta uh, and um, they have vascular tissue and so on. And they're called epiphytes because they live on top of uh, or on the surface of some other structure, in this case of the plant. Uh, and they have... Um, those roots that are capable of picking up uh, things they need from the air, uh, including nitrogen. And uh, we have those around here. If you go down near the river and there's some old growth trees, which this kinds of habitats, unfortunately, are rare uh, for our area because of the habitat loss we've experienced over the last uh, 100, 120 years uh, since uh, ag agriculture came to the area here. Uh, now, sometimes commensalism may not be... Uh, what we thought it was. This has always been a famous example in textbooks. The oxpeckers, they like to perch on top of uh, these herbivorous uh, type of mammals and pick off parasites like ticks and so on. However, these oxpeckers have also been observed picking at scabs and drinking blood from the, from the mammal uh, as well. So that could be seen as harmful to the animal. So uh, is it... Uh, is it uh, mutualistic? Is it commensal? Uh, is it uh, is it a parasitic? If you ask me, this image with the uh, red eyes or makes these birds kind of look a little bit scary. Uh, I don't know if that's a, a color problem with the coloring of the photo or that's what they really have red eyes. I need to look that up. Now, um, the uh, effects of interaction of these species uh, overall. Uh, the ecological process do have these effects. So uh, what is what can predation do uh, to a, a community? Well, predation can reduce competition. Uh, and uh, we should consider that for a little bit. How could that occur? Um, so the kinds of, first of all, the kinds of animals that a predator is going to eat depends on what the selection is. Like it's like, you know, like a buffet, right? What do you have? to eat out there. So what the predator is going to tend to eat if they're not very specialized is whatever's available there that uh, uh, that's within the range of things they normally eat. Uh, so whatever the predator does is a matter of what the abundance is, the relative abundance of the prey items. If there's more rats than there is rabbits, then we might shift our diet during that time. So thinking about what's available to eat, if there's a lot of one a certain type of prey species uh, and it, it's the most abundant in that uh, area where the community is. Uh, they would be probably superior at competing for resources when it comes to other potential prey items. So what is the predator going to end up doing if there's an overabundance of one kind of prey uh, species or item? The predator is going to eat some of those, many of those, and that's going to reduce that competitor. Uh, and what effect does that have Um that allows, if you're able to take out a superior uh, 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 a prey item that's very good at getting resources, the predator's going to bring down those numbers and allow other kinds of uh, prey to live in that area as well. So the predation has an effect overall of allowing other species to uh, that might otherwise be outcompeted uh, by the superior competitor. Uh, it's going to allow these others to exist. And there's an example here with uh, starfish. Starfish like to eat um, uh, shelled animals like clams and so on. And barnacles are are um, are uh, sort of a shelled animal. Barnacles are arthropods, though. But uh, there's a similar structure. So starfish uh, here, 
uh, can eat barnacles just the way they can eat clams. And barnacles without a predator are just going to totally cover uh, an area of, like you see the picture on the right. But if you put a starfish in there, which are predators, boy, they have a lot of barnacles to eat. So they're going to eat those over other potential prey items. And what they do is they help reduce the number of barnacles and that allows other kinds of animals to move into the area uh, and exist. Otherwise, without the starfish, then we just become one large barnacle mat uh, and there's not much species diversity there. So, um, now the parasitism can have an effect on, on the competitors that are competing for the resource. So there was uh, some studies done uh, to uh, highlight this situation that when parasites come into the picture here, they can change the dynamics that go on within those competitions that are occurring. Uh, we're also, uh, the, the case of an example here is that when you have a competition for resources between two species, when there is a parasite present, one species might be good at uh, uh, outcompeting the other one, but then if a parasite comes in that affects these uh, competitors, then you might see it, uh, uh, the other species uh, now being able to do better. And this case, the, an example of this comes from uh, beetles called flower beetles. They're in the genus called tribolium. They didn't write uh, tribolium, it's just T, but it stands for tribolium. There's tribolium cast, uh, castaneum and tribolium confusum. Uh, and when there's a parasite, and the parasite is, an in, is a larval stage of a tapeworm, and I found a life cycle of a tapeworm. I guess this is its scientific name here. It's not written correctly because that should be a lowercase d. But this is an image of the skulls of the tapeworm, and this tapeworm is uh, a rodent tapeworm. And so within the rodent's gut, the eggs are produced just like with any tapeworm. They're released into the environment, and then they get picked up by these beetles. And then the beetles uh, are going to have a larval stage within their hemocyl. The hemocyl is a body cavity where the hemolymph occurs. And then the beetles end up getting eaten by a rodent because rodents uh, will be uh, opportunistic. It's a good protein meal. Pick up an insect and eat it. And so they become infected again. So uh, the intermediate host are these types of beetles. And so it turns out that without the parasite, uh, Tribolium castaneum is dominant within that um, uh, within that community where uh, as if the parasite is present in that, uh, within those uh, beetles, then the other beetle becomes dominant, uh, Tribolum confusum. I'm not sure the mechanism of that, if the, there's a tendency for one species to pick up uh, the egg more than the other one, or just that uh, they both become infested with the, uh, um, with the larva of the tapeworms, and um, this species is better able to cope with that and, and then uh, be better at competing for resources. Uh, and then uh, we see a, a case here, if we look at the graph on the right and the picture of a kangaroo rat again, and in cases where they're studying ant colonies uh, and they introduce, uh, they remove the, the kangaroo rat and uh, the studies were done in uh, 1974, so you can exclude the kangaroo rat from an area there. And they were counting the number of ant colonies, because ants live in colonies. And uh, they removed rodents from, uh, from uh, an area. Uh, and then the other area, they didn't, in other areas, they didn't remove the rodents. And where they didn't remove the rodents, we see that overall the numbers of colonies stayed, uh, if we just uh, you know, do a, some sort of a best fit model line, the number of colonies stayed relatively low. Now, if they remove the rodents from an area, we saw that the ant colony started out here about the same, and they started to increase, right? And so the ant um, colonies increased, and then they suddenly come back down again. But overall, the effect of removing those kangaroo rats was that allowed a lot more ant colonies. Now, the rodents are not necessarily eating the ants. So what's going on here? It's an indirect effect. Okay? So the indirect effect here is uh, the case here. This rodent is going to be eating larger seeds. Okay? So the rodent has a negative effect on the population of plants that produce larger seeds. Okay? Those larger seeds, if present 
are better at competing for space than smaller seed plants. So the, lar the presence of the larger seed plant has a negative effect on the smaller seeded plant. Okay? And so that's going to be um, an issue. So what happens here is that the, the, the kangaroo rat, by eating the larger seeds and being present here, is going to make more uh, or allow space for the smaller seeds uh, to grow. And so with smaller seeds, the, the ants now have a, a preferred choice of food and more of the smaller seeds available for them. Uh, so that benefits the ant that the rodent is eating the larger seeds. And so what that does is this dotted line represents an indirect effect or an, uh, an indirect positive benefit to the ant, not directly, but indirectly by eating the large seeds. So this is uh, an example of a more complex interaction. And then there's uh, the idea of keystone species. And a keystone species, um, they actually have a significant effect on the composition of the biological communities in an area. Uh, and so um, if you were to remove this keystone species, the, the, con the composition in terms of the types of species you see there would change drastically. And usually... Uh, the change would be to one that's less diverse, so less species, uh, a lower species diversity without the keystone species. So these keystone species are responsible for promoting a great deal of species diversity, which is viewed as being a healthier situation for the environment. A good example is what we just covered, those sea stars eating the barnacles. Without the sea stars, the barnacles overgrow everything and the, the species diversity goes down. They use the word species richness. It's it's they're related, the two. Uh, richness is how many species you have there. Uh, you have one species or two species. Diversity includes the relative amounts of each one. Another example of a keystone species not listed here is the alligator. The alligators help keep shorelines clear, and that provides space for other kinds of species to use, otherwise be grown over with vegetation. Uh, and then there's beavers. The beavers are known for building habitats that would not exist otherwise. They put up a dam and block str uh, small streams, and that prevents water from flowing down, and that builds up uh, some backwater area that's still. And so that creates a marshy area where, uh, behind the dam where you would get um, a whole other uh, 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 living space for a community, of, a diverse community of other types of uh, plants and animals. So here's an example of a beaver dam here and some of that water that's being held back there. Uh, and that makes this beaver a keystone species example. So the last topic of this chapter is ecological succession, uh, disturbance and species richness, uh, which uh, I like to use the word diversity instead. Um, so looking at the learning outcomes for this section, we're going to divide, define what succession is and distinguish between primary and secondary succession, and then describe how early colonizers may affect subsequent occurrences of other species. Uh, species come into an area that's been uh, disturbed, uh, like weeds, and then they uh, change the area and then other species come in. So this is a succession uh, that we're talking about. And then um, the third one here is explain how the disturbance can either positively or negatively affect your species diversity or your species richness. So uh, looking at what succession is. So the communities, the, uh, let's say uh, we start with the plant community and the animals follow uh, this uh, succession. So the communities are going to have a tendency to change uh, from simple to more complex, and that's uh, what succession is about. Now, there is a primary succession, uh, and this occurs when you start with nothing. So you start with bare rock, the, either bedrock or a volcanic eruption. In other words, there was no soil there to start with. All of the terrestrial uh, ecosystems uh, or communities always start uh, um out more simple and then uh, move to more complex. So uh, if we start with bare rock where it was lifeless, we're gonna call that uh, primary succession. So this could be on rocks or in open water. And uh, organisms are gonna gradually move in. And as they move in, they change the nature of the area there. Uh, they actually will do things like starting to create soil. And so when we see, uh, this is the case here, 
this is an area where on the bottom picture where uh, it looks like there was a glacier. So a glaciers as they retreat, uh, when there were once large uh, tens to hundreds of feet deep of ice covering, say, North America, um, as they they built up weight, they start to move uh, along the continent, and they literally scrape out any soil that was there before. And then when they melt away, all that you have left is this bedrock here, uh, and there's not much soil there. So what's left there there's no soil for plants to grow so we got to have some early colonizers here that can go in there and build soil this process is going to take lots of time and those early colonizers are things like lichens which we studied those lichens can grow anywhere they grow on rocks and they're the symbiotic relationship between fungi and an algae or a cyanobacterium and as they grow they build a biomass they die they decay and they're adding now um, carbon and nitrogen to the to the uh, rock that they broke down with their acids and so uh, this starts to build soil little by little and then new species start coming in uh, er earlier species and then later species with bigger trees but you can see what happens here uh, in terms of measuring something that's important for uh, plant growth is the nitrogen concentration plants need nitrogen when we talk about plant food they make their own sugars, but they need nitrogen and phosphorus in order to build important compounds like DNA and uh, proteins. So you can see here that over time, starting with the lichens over here, uh, early, early at time zero, we start with bedrock, little by little, the amount of nitrogen in the soil starts to increase. And then as uh, plants start to grow above ground, uh, they uh, their leaves settle on the, on the floor and on the ground and so on. So you start to see nitrogen building up uh, on the on there as well. So overall, the, the physical composition is changing. Uh, and so we start with that primary succession with bare rock, uh, then lichens, your early colonizers, then you're gonna have small uh, plants, uh, annual plants that complete their life cycle in here, then grasses come in. Then you start to have shrubs and trees, like pine trees, they might not be tolerant of shade, so they grow up pretty tall. And then ultimately you get, hundreds of years down the road, you get these tall trees, broadleaf trees that are that are more tolerant of shade. So they can grow underneath the shade of these other trees, but then as they get big enough, they change the physical nature and replace these uh, other plants that were there before. So that's what's meant by succession. Uh, the series of changes where one group of a community of organisms comes and paves the way for another group to come in. Uh, and then there's secondary succession. And here, the, the difference here for secondary succession is that uh, for, uh, for secondary, well, so sometimes we could say that's a second degree. In this case here, there was already soil. So that might be uh, like if we were farming in the field and you're constantly plowing up the field and then all of a sudden you stop farming the area, it's gonna start to go through a succession. There was already soil there and that's the key. There is uh, to secondary succession. There was already life there to begin with, uh, some sort of plant community and soil. Uh, so this process will take less years because the built soil takes a long time, and then the community comes in. So secondary succession would take less time, but it's still going to take, on order, depending on what kind of plant communities you're talking about, on the order of about 100 years or so. But you will see the stages uh, are going to be quite similar. If we leave out the bare rock part. You're going to have your annual plants coming in in the first and second year, and then grasses, then uh, shrubs and uh, uh, pine type trees, uh, and then your broadleaf trees coming in. So you see that same series of successions without the bare rock. Okay. Now, why does succession happen? This is a key point right here. So succession happens because species that are, are living at that present time, whether it's the first and second year or the fifth year or five to a hundred years here. When those species are there, they're gonna change that habitat uh, and the resources that are available. For example, how much nitrogen is available there. Uh, and that's gonna favor new species uh, to come in to the area and cause that replacement. So why does succession happen? Uh, there are some dynamic concepts that are associated with what it means by dynamic is that these are not static situations, but uh, things will be changing. And so the first one is establishment here. So when succession is going to occur, uh, 
whether it's a primary or a secondary succession, you're going to have establishment. And here you have your early successional species. We sometimes refer to these as pioneer species, like the pioneers that went out west and uh, in the early times of uh, the, uh, the when this nation was young. And so they, they, uh, the, the characteristic of these pioneer species is that they have R selection. Remember there was R selected and K selected species in terms of their life history characteristics. These are ones that complete their life cycle uh, quickly and they produce a lot of offspring. And that's characteristic of weeds and grasses and so on. Uh, now, after they come in, then we go into a facilitation uh, process here. And those early successional species that had been established, our selected ones, are going to lay the foundation for uh, other species to come in. And so the R selected species then give way to K selected species, the larger species, the ones that take longer to complete their life cycles. Now we're talking about uh, shrubs and trees. Uh, and then inhibition here uh, is another concept that occurs during this time. And here it is that the changes in the habitat caused by one species is going to, as new species come in, they're going to create changes that are going to inhibit or slow the growth uh, and reproduction of uh, the original species that were there. For example, if taller trees start coming in, they're going to start to shade out the, some of the smaller species, and that's going to inhibit the those pioneer species from growing. Uh, so when, when plants... When the plant structure changes, the plant community structure changes, that's going to cause a change in the in the animal communities too because animals uh, typically have certain habitats they're associated with because of, of uh, evolutionary processes that have uh, had these, these animals evolve to live in certain kinds of habitats. And so when the plant community goes through changes, the animal community will too. So there'll, there'll be faunal changes. So the fauna goes through a change. Uh, and uh, your animal community changes. So this one is highlighted uh, with an example from the book of, a, of an island called uh, Krakato Krakatoa Island. And uh, it is uh, a volcanic eruption occurred there. And when volcan a volcanic eruption occurs, if... Uh, it's going to leave a lot of ash or, or molten rock, and that's going to there's not going to be any plant life. So you're going to go through a, a succession, and if it's rock that's left behind, volcanic rock, you're going to go through a primary uh, succession. And so as the plant life begins to change, you're going to start to see the animal life change in the early animal communities, and this occurs in synchrony. The plants begin to go through succession, and then the types of animals you see there. Now, the changes that occur with animals can also, in turn, have some sort of a feedback influence or effect. So they, there's an interplay between both the animal and the plant community, and how can that be? Well, the plants are, uh, the animals are eating the plants. They're pollinators for plants. Animals spread seed for plants. So uh, all of these things are occurring, and the, there's this uh, in, interconnection between the two, the animal and the plant communities that influence each other. There's a picture of that island after the eruption or during the eruption, and then uh, what the island looked like uh, some years after the eruption. You can see the, the, the vegetational changes there, and it is quite likely that the animal life that uh, is taking advantage of that uh, plant structure, uh, plant community there, is much different than when there was bare ground. So... Um, the uh, changes that do occur within communities are constantly occurring. There's uh, never a community that's static, a plant community. And uh, why do these plant communities go through changes? Well, because we have we can have seasonal changes uh, that occur. We can have cycle changes that occur every 10 years. You might go through a 10-year droughts, things like that. So changes in climate, weather patterns, uh, species, new species coming in, invasions that can cause, create problems or changes, and then disturbances uh, that can occur. There are fire uh, going through an area or something as simple as a tall tree falling and knocking out an opening by uh, crushing other trees in its path. All of these things would be considered disturbances. And so it would be um, a better model to think about these dynamics or these changes that occur within communities in terms of a non-equilibrium model, okay? And not, if you're in equilibrium, 
then you're going to be in this certain balance. But the communities, as they're observed, tend to always be in a constant state of not balance because of disturbances that are occurring here. Uh, so that's the idea behind a non-equilibrium model. It's going to emphasize the fact that change is always occurring uh, in these plant communities rather than some stable statics uh, situation. So there is the idea of an intermediate disturbance hypothesis, which is uh, gained uh, uh, more favor within the, the, the ecologist community uh, rather than uh, what used to be that uh, you, you made it to a climax community, which would suggest you're at a stable ultimate plant community in which it's not really supported by what's, what the evidence shows. So here, uh, thinking about an intermediate disturbance hypothesis, if we think about uh, communities that experience moderate moderate, so somewhere between uh, not having any and having a whole lot of disturbance. So if you have a, a, a moderate or intermediate amount of disturbance, that that community is going to have a higher uh, levels of species diversity okay? than a plant community that uh, is constantly being severely disturbed, uh, then you're going to have lower species diversity or one that's never disturbed at all, then you're going to have just some of those ultimately huge trees and not very much uh, else around in the ground cover there. So the idea of the intermediate disturbance hypothesis uh, would suggest that you would get better species diversity in the area. Uh, and when you do get these, uh, inter these uh, moderate uh, disturbances, you're going to have basically patches of... Uh, of habitat within an area that are at different stages of succession. And so you're going to have bunches of diversity within the overall area there. Uh, and this intermediate disturbance actually prevents uh, plant community from ever getting to those final stages, which you see in some diagrams like the one I uh, included, which is extra than what's in the book. Uh, they would refer to those types as a climax or ultimate uh, community, the climax plant community. And so, again, that's uh, not so much a favored uh, concept anymore. Uh, so the role of disturbance, uh, you can see a plant, uh, a tree has fallen there in the forest. And uh, the, the role of disturbance, it seems that disturbance is more common rather than the exception. So actually finding plant communities that are in this ultimate climax uh, stage uh, may not be something that we see because even in mature forest, trees fall, fires happen, things like that. Uh, a flood comes in um, uh, from time to time. So understanding how disturbances affect uh, these plant communities and these overall uh, biological communities is an important thing of consideration uh, to ecologists who study this, uh, these phenomena.